Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to the grade four lessons today. We we're excited once again to be teaching you and we look forward to hearing some feedback of what you thought of our lessons. Once again, it's quite cold here, not as cold as yesterday, but it's still cold. Boys and girls, I want to start off by talking about Monday morning. Those of you who are coming to fetch your packs on Monday morning, you're going to come to the bottom gate, okay? And you will look for your teachers and you will come and get your worksheets. Let me show you what they're going to look like. Here it is and all ready for you, okay? You're gonna collect that, this from your teachers and this is everything printed out for the week. Then for English, I would like you to please hand in your DBE book. Okay, I'd like to mark it and just see what you've been doing these holidays. Don't worry if it's not so neat or anything. I would just like to see how you've been doing. Then I would like to hand out your English book to you. Okay, so on Monday morning, you are going to fetch your English book and you're going to do, your, do the work in it. And that means that you have to work neatly. Rule off. After your last work, write the date, write the heading, and underline it. Okay. For Afrikaans, you are going, you are going to write on a piece of paper and in your homework books. Uh, you're going to bring your homework books, sorry. You're going to bring your homework books for Afrikaans, and you're going to give it to Mrs. Matucci so that she can mark it. And you are going to be working then on pieces of paper. And that is the same for all the other subjects. You're going to be working on pieces of paper. So when you've finished and you're going to hand your pack back, you need to remember to take all the pieces of paper, okay, have your name on each one, put them in a plastic sleeve, and it's ready to be handed in. Okay, we're going to start today's lessons now. We're going to start off with geography with Miss Robin. So I hope you are ready and have everything with you. Enjoy. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm going to mark the work that you had to do this week. It was the work on grids. So please get out your work and a pencil. You had to use the figure in your textbook. I'm going to put that up on the screen for you to see and explain each question step. Right, you should be able now to see the grid that is over the picture. The first thing we need to do is check the key. Because this is a picture and not an actual map, you will see that there is no key. The next is the grid going over. You will see you've got numbers one, two, three, and four going down, and letters A, B, C, D, E, F, and G going across. This is going to divide your picture into smaller blocks, which we will use to locate the objects on the picture. Let's have a look at activity seven. Question one, use the grid references in figure 3.2 to describe the position of the tall building. So if you have a look, the tall building with the two aerials on top will be in E1. Good morning, and apologies for the interruption. Mrs. Rudolph said, if you could please make your way to Mrs. Amod's car. Thank you. Question two. The split in the main road near the city centre. Now, you have to be very careful because if you were looking, you will see that there is a city. Just hold on, I just realised we're having some technical difficulties. I would like the presentation to come up for you to see. Okay, I'm going to then um, just show you with the textbook. I see. 
Alright, so boys and girls, if you have a look, you will see that this part here was the city. And this part over there was actually the village. Ah, uh, we are back. Thank you. And it's gone again. Right, we'll carry on. So the splits in the road, boys and girls, you will see will be an F2, as that is the city. Let's see questions. Right, uh, then boys and girls, the village with the huts would be in A2. The boat gives two grid positions. It doesn't matter in which order, as long as you are giving the letter, which is the easting first, and then the numeral. So the boat you would find in B1 and C1. You then also had to complete another activity, which was on page 33 of your textbook. And we're just going to get that next picture up for you so we can have a look. Use the key and the grid in figure 3.5 to help you name the places on the map. So you had to find B2. So again, you can use a ruler and a pencil to help you. I'm going to show you with the cursor. So you find letter B and you go all the way down to it matches with number 2. You will see a symbol there. And like I said, always use your key to find what the symbol means. And you will see that that symbol is showing you a post office. Then you had to find out what was an A3. So again, boys and girls, you go up, find letter A, and you can even count one, two, three. You will see there are houses in A3. C3. Again, if you have a ruler and a pencil, you could find letter C and rule a line down. And then you could find number three and rule a line across. Where your two lines touch each other, that is the block that you need to be looking in. You will see in that block is a station. In A1, you will see a symbol, it has the fire, and that is showing you a fire station. Then the last one for that question says B3. Again, locate letter B, move down to where it matches with number three. And you will see there that you have got a hospital. Question two says, use the grid references to describe the position of these places. So now, boys and girls, they're asking it the other way around. They're telling you which symbol, you've got to find that symbol on your map and tell us which block it is in. Remember, when you are writing your grid reference, it needs to be in print with a capital letter. You will write your easting down first, which is your numeral, uh, your letter A, B, or C, and second, the number, either one, two, or three. So if we have a look, they want the church. So you look at your key, the symbol for the church will be the cross. You find where the cross is and you have a look which block is it in. So the church will be in B1. Then we've got the library. Again, go down to your key and find the symbol for the library. You will see it's a book. You then find your book on your little map and you have a look which block it is in. That is known as your grid reference. Again, you will go up, you'll see it's letter A, and to the side will be number two. So the grid reference for the library will be A2. Then we need to find the shops. So again, you will look what is the symbol for the shops. Here it is. It's a little shopping bag and you will need to find it on the map. If you follow the cursor, you can see it's going over two blocks. Don't let that confuse you. 
have a look which block it is in mostly. And you will see it is in C2. Next, they want the police station. If you look at your key, you'll see the symbol for the police station is the little police badge, which is a star. Find it on your map. Have a look which block. It will be in B1. The last one there is the school. Again, you can see why it's so important that you always look at your key. You will notice that the symbol for the school is two little um, children. It's not a building. So you will have to look for the matching symbol on your map. You will see it is over here. And the grid reference will then be C2. I hope this helped you with your lesson. And good luck for next week's lesson, we will be doing directions. Right, boys and girls, we're going to carry on now. Right, boys and girls, we're going to carry on now, and we're going to do English. I'm going to be going over yesterday's work, which was idioms. So if you have your English DBE book with you, you can actually mark what you did yesterday or if answers, then you can write them down now. Okay, so we're going to be looking in your DBE book, page 118, page 118. And I'm going to show you the PowerPoint that I made. There we go. Right, boys and girls, so... An idiom is an expression. It is an expression that we use when we speak to make what we are saying more interesting. Okay? Idioms are expressions that mean something different from the usual meaning of the words. And boys and girls, it is a figure of speech. As you go up into grade 5, 6, and 7, you will have to know that an idiom is an expression, is a figure of speech. Right, let's carry on and look at the different expressions we were learning about. Right, the first idiom is, my father has green fingers, his garden is beautiful. So, that doesn't mean that my father really has green fingers. It means that... Let me show you what it means. It means that he is very good at gardening. He is very good at gardening. Okay, right. Let's go on to the next idiom. Lulu spilled the beans. Now everyone knows my secret. Right, so that doesn't really mean that Lulu actually spilled the beans. It means that she revealed something that is meant to be a secret. So if you spill the beans, it is to reveal something that is meant to be a secret. Let's look at the next one. Right, Joe is a real bookworm. He always has his nose in a book. I'm sure we have some grade fours who think they are real bookworms and they love to have their nose in the book. And it doesn't mean you, that you are a real bookworm. It means that you love to read. Okay, right, let's go on. The next one says, I went to see a scary movie and my hair stood on end. Now, this doesn't mean that your hair is really standing on end because then the person behind you wouldn't be able to see. No, it means, let's go back, he became very frightened. So that's why his hair was standing on end. He became very frightened. Let's go to the next one. Did I really get 100% for my test or are you pulling my leg? Right. And it really means she is joking. Okay, if someone pulls your leg, they are joking. Next one. 
I can't afford that computer game. It costs an arm and a leg. And you're not going to really hand in an arm and a leg when you get to the till. It means that it is very expensive. It costs a lot of money. Maybe if you ask mom or dad for something, they'll say, no, that costs an arm and a leg. Right, let's go on. Jabu and his brother are so similar. They are like two peas in a pod. So if children or friends are similar, we say they are like two peas in a pod. And here you can see a pod. And in a pod, we get some peas. I don't know if any of you have maybe helped your mom or grandmother take the peas out of a pod. And this simply means that the friends are very similar. Right, next one. We did not discuss it because it is a hot potato. There's a hot potato. So, if something is a hot potato, it means that we don't like to talk about it. Some people do not want to talk about this because it can lead to arguments. So maybe you're sitting around the table with your family and friends and they start bringing up something and someone says, let's not talk about that. It is a hot potato. Right, let's go on to the next one. He really gets things done. He is on the ball. I wonder if you can get, think of someone that is on the ball. I can think of Mr. Bryant now. He's really on the ball with everything at school, getting us ready for the children to come back. And we would say that if you are on the ball, you are quick to take actions and get things done. Let's go on. The maths test was so easy, it was a piece of cake. Right, so you're not really eating a piece of cake for your maths test. It simply means that the test was easy and you nailed it. Look at that guy so chuffed with what he did. Right, boys and girls, and that is your English idioms. So I hope that you learned them and maybe you can use them one day when you are writing. Okay, and today's lesson is on crumpets. You have to answer some questions on a recipe. And then maybe if mom allows you, you can even make the crumpets at home. Okay, right, we're now going to go on and we are going to do our NS lesson. Enjoy, boys and girls. Good morning, grade fours. I'm just going to get back to video. Oh, yeah. And my video. Okay, see, so still learning the technical issues of all of it. Welcome back. It was really nice to see you yesterday. And um, today we're going to learn about raw and manufactured materials. But before we start with that, I just want to do a little bit of revision of what we did yesterday. Remember, solid particles close together, liquid particles a little bit further apart and they can flow, and gas particles even further apart and they float about in the sky. Now, can you remember the water cycle wiggle we did? We're just going to spend two minutes doing that. Got the sun up in the sky, the heat coming down, the water evaporating, the clouds condensing, the precipitation coming down back down to the ground, and that's rain, hail, sleet, and snow. Those are the different kinds of precipitation. Runoff, the water coming down the hill, collection in lakes and dams, and then the evaporation starts again, and the whole process is a cycle. Just going over it again, in case you forgot it from yesterday. I'm going to start the PowerPoint. So then you can see what I'm talking about today. And there we go. So today we're going to start with solid materials. We've learned about solids, liquids, and gases, and now we're concentrating on just the solid materials. Solid materials are defined or separated into raw and manufactured materials. When I think of raw, the first picture that pops into my head is a raw piece of meat. Are you going to eat the raw piece of meat just like that? No, I don't think so. I think that would be kind of yucky. So, you've got to do something to the raw material to make it edible. So, you want to eat it, and that is called a manufactured material. So, raw materials are found in nature. If you can pick them off a tree, if you find them in the bush, in the felt, 
if you mine them, if you find them in the sea, those are all raw materials. Nothing has happened to them yet. Manufactured materials, on the other hand, is something has happened to them or a person has done something to them or a factory to make them useful. So manufactured materials are made or processed from raw materials into something useful. Going on to the next slide. Okay. Another technical issue, and our technical whiz, Mrs. Renica, has seemed to have Just disappeared. Sorry. Uh, no, but, um, yeah, but it's not on, but going down to the next slide. Um, oh, Mrs. Renica, we had a glitch. How do I go to the next slide? Okay, we'll go on to PowerPoint. Go. Ah, uh, you see? There you go. Thank you. Very much. Okay, so now we're going to go use, or now we're going to look at the different raw and manufactured materials. The first one we're looking at is clay. Can you see that the first picture is uh, a person in a pit? He's digging in what looks like sand, but that is actually clay. That clay is mined or taken out of the pit, and then you can use it to make pottery products. Another form of clay is called china or ceramics. Now, I'm not talking about the big country china in the east. I'm talking about a very fine white powder. Um, and that is used to make ceramics. Ceramics are the mugs and the bowls and the plates that you eat off. Let's go on to the next slide. Which one? Number three. It's just nice to see. And there we go. Okay, got a free slide. So, thank you, Mrs. Renica. Okay, then we've got our other raw materials, which are oil and coal. Now, oil and coal are incredibly useful materials, and there are so many products that oil and coal are made out of. I can't go into each manufacturing process because I will be here till you're in grade seven and I don't think you want that. So if you look at the first picture, those are big, that's a, how they mine oil, that first picture. And then the second picture is what oil looks like. Oil is used to make petrol that we use to fill our cars. Now grade fours, I just want to point out something here and remember that we live in South Africa and we don't live in America. The stuff that we put in our car is called petrol. It's not called gas. Please don't say gas, because if I ask you for an example of a liquid and you say gas, I'm going to say no, because that's a gas. So just a little bit of um, information that I know you get confused about. Then we've got coal. Coal is mined from underground, and many, many things are made out of coal and oil. Plastics, paints, toys, so many different products. Without coal and oil, we wouldn't really be able to function like we do today. So, very important, if you've gone through your textbook, they go into more details on how coal and oil is made. And our next raw material that we're looking at is just... Okay. Where do you want it? Number four. Is that it? Yeah. There we go. We've got wood. Um, so... I don't need to go into too much detail. Wood is a raw material used to make many different products. It's cut into logs, and then you get desks and benches and chairs and tables and paper. All sorts of things are made out of wood. Remember, the raw material is what is found in nature, and the manufactured material is what it is made out of, the more useful product. Now we go on to sand. Sand makes glass. Who would have thought? Not just sand on its own. It's mixed with soda ash and limestone. And on my notes, there was a link that showed you how sand was actually made into glass. Incredibly interesting. And another very interesting YouTube video you can watch is how they blow glass. They put a bubble of liquid glass at the end of a tube and they blow into it and they make the most beautiful things. 
So if you can, please look at those videos. They really, really are interesting. So anyway, raw materials, the sand, limestone, and ash get mixed together. They get heated at a very high temperature. Remember, sand is a solid. When the solids are heated, they melt. And that is what becomes the liquid glass. And they're pictures of glass bottles and glass sheets. Okay, moving on to our next um, raw material is cotton. Now, there's a picture of um, people or workers in the field picking cotton plants. The cotton plant, that is actually the flower, those little fluffy balls. It's very different to the cotton wool balls that you buy in the shop. That is totally different. This is the cotton plant. Now, cotton plants, they get um, spun into thread, and that thread gets woven into clothes. And you can see all the different pictures of clothes, which would be the manufactured material. Moving on to wool, that is a, a gentleman shearing a sheep, giving us the raw material wool. And wool is spun and made into jerseys and beanies and scarves and all the wonderful things that we need for winter right now. Now, grade fours, I want to show you all, I want you to think about the difference between cotton and wool because many of you get confused. Wool is used for clothing that we need when it's cold to keep us warm. So wool for warmth, remember the wa. And then cotton is used to make clothing that keeps us cool in summer. So cotton, the C is for co um, cotton and cool in summer. Just to so you don't get confused between the two. And then we move on to our last raw material, which is leather or cowhide. That is the skin of a cow that is made into leather. And there are pictures of leather shoes and leather belts and leather jackets and gloves and all sorts of things that keep us also warm in winter. Great force. Main thing I want you to remember, raw material. Nothing has happened to it yet. It is found in nature. Manufactured materials, they have gone through a process to make them more useful. Just looking at that last slide again, that cowhide, if you try to wear it on your feet, are you going to be able to do anything with it? Would it help you walk? Not at all. It has to be manufactured or processed to make into shoes or belts or jackets, and then that product is useful. Thank you very much for listening. I'm now going to pass you over to Mrs. Matucci for Afrikaans, and have a good afternoon, grade fours. Good morning. Well, today we're going to net over Wednesday and Donnerdag's work. We're just going to go through Wednesday and Thursday's work, and work the spell word and also your spelling words. So I want you to have your spelling words ready in front of you. Right, I'm going to say it, and then I want you. I'm going to pause a little bit, and I want you to repeat it to make sure that we are pronouncing it properly. Nummer 1, mis. Nummer 2, reen. En onthou, and remember, on the reen, on the second E, we have those two little dots. Who remembers what they were called? Double tierken. And the double tierken, I'll tell you in English, it's easier for you to understand. The double tierken, it just tells you how to pronounce the word. So, is nie reen nie, dit is reen. Nummer 3, son skein. Nummer 4, sneeuw. Nummer 5, wind. I hope you repeat it after me to make sure we say them correctly. Nummer 6, wai. Die wind wai, the wind blows. Nummer 7 is weer. Nummer 8, nat. Nege, weer voorspellen. If you couldn't find that, it's a weather forecast. Nummer 10, kachel. If you could not find that, it is a fireplace. 
nummer 11, brand. When something burns. 4, warm. If we translate it directly, it's fire hot. And that is when something is extremely hot. Uh, number 13, ice coat. So it's gister, like yesterday, freezing cold. Number 14, rain dribbles. Number 15, a rain yas. That is a raincoat, if you couldn't find it. In number 16 is splat, and that is to splash. I just want you to remember something I want to point out. There's quite a few words here. Wind, vai, weer, weer, voor, spelling. Remember in Afrikaans, die klanke, the sounds. A W sounds different in Afrikaans. It's fear, so does wind, in vai. Right, we're going to move on now to our Wednesday and Thursday's work, Woensdag and Donnerdag. Again, I'm going to read the poem to you. Ik gaan die gedichie lees. I'm going to read a set a line. Ik gaan een sin lees. And then I want you to say it out loud after me. Winter rain pee. Tip, tap. Water spots. Rien ripples op die pot. Tap, tap, water spot. Alle sommer go go nat. I hope you're repeating it after me. Die kinders wil graag beter speel. Maar het rien net heel te mal te veel. Tip, tap, water spat. Speel, speel ik hier binnen op die mat. In die kachel brandt die vier. En die rien bly val eer na eer. I'm just going to quickly go over it in English that you understood what it meant. So a tip top water spot, it's drip, drip, the water is splashing. Rain ripples, raindrops are falling on the road. Again, drip, drip, or tip top, the water is dripping. Everything is suddenly very wet. The children would love to go and play outside, but it is raining too much. Tip tap, water spot. So we keep repeating that. It's like a little theme of the poem. They are playing little games. Spiele keys. On toe, keys, it's a little game. On spiel, and a spiele key is a little game. Burner inside of die mat. In die kachel brandt die vier. There's a lovely fire burning in the fireplace. In die rien blij fall. Ear na ear, and the rain is continuing to fall hour after hour. Ah, answer for you. I'm not going to give you the answers today, but I'm going to quickly go through the questions and explain them in English in case you aren't sure. So, kijk voor de woensdag. Nummer A, number A. In water seizoen speel die gedig af. I'm asking you here, in what season is it taking place? And if you look at the title, the title, it will give you the answer. On to, je moet in a full sentence scrape. Remember, we are writing in a full sentence. So to answer that, you will start off. Die gedig vind plaas in hmm. En jy gee die seizoen, and you give the season. Nummer B. Wat word dier die woorde tip, taf, beskryf? So what are they describing when they are using the words tip, taf? It's the sound of something. And you can answer that in a short sentence in Afrikaans. Hoekom, wat is hoekom, why? 
Hoekom kan die spreke nie buiten toe gaan nie? Why can the author of this little poem, or it says the speaker, but the person is writing the poem, why can they not go and play outside? So, hulle kan nie buiten speel nie omdat en gee die rede, and then you give the reason. En die laaste een, wat er seisoen is jou ginstelling seisoen? So I'm asking you here, what is your favorite season? And who come? Why? You can give your own answer here. You tell me which season you like the best. And one short sentence, why you like that season. Okay, let's move on to Thursday, Donnerdag. That was gisterse werk. These are questions on the poem, but they're more little toll werk, asking about your language. So these you can just answer in, a, in just the answer. You don't need to write out the whole sentence. Nummer A, number A. Schrijf al die woorden wat rijm neer. So you're going to go and look through the poem and you're going to write out all the pairs of the rhyming words. So you can just write them together, leave a little space and write down the next two rhyming words. Nummer B. Schrijf die woord in die gedig wat met een deelteken geskryf word. So look through your poem for the word that has a little deelteken on it and you're going to just write down that word. You don't need a whole sentence, yeah? Gee nog twee voorbeelde van woorde wat met een deelteken geskryf word. I would like you to give me another two examples of words that you know that also have a little deelteken. You're not going to find these answers in the poem. You need to think about words we've learned in class that have a little deal tierken. And there's quite a few that you should be able to come up with. You just need to give me two examples. Tweer voorbeelde. En die laaste een, skryf voorbeelde van die volgende woordsoorte uit die gedig neer. We are looking for parts of speech here. And all you need to do again is write down your answer, not a whole sentence. I want you to look for twee werkwoorde. Onto, a werkwoord is a verb, your action word. So you're going to just write down two verbs, twee werkwoorde, from the poem. In vier, I want you to look for four, selfstandige naamwoorde, which are your common nouns. So again, you're going to look through the poem, you're going to find four nouns, and you're going to just write those words down. I'm not going to go through all of today's work, it's quite clear. You just need to uh, go to page 73, blad C3 and 70. And you must A, B, and C do. Good, we are En sien jylle volgende week. Meneer Piri, Mr. Piri is now coming to present a little maths lesson to you. Good morning, great folks. I hope you are fine at home and you are feeling warm this morning. Uh, today we are going to look at a new special topic by the name Common Fractions. Say this word after me. Common fractions. This is what we are going to be looking at. You take this one in grade one, two, three, up to now, but grade four now becomes even more and more complicated. But the bottom line is, since you are at home now, I'm sure you, feel you are very much comfortable, such that when I give you these examples, you are going to do and enjoy it at home. But before I explain on common fractions, I hope and believe that we have been doing all the work that I have been sending you. That is whole numbers, addition, separation, multiplication, and division. So on our uh, common fractions, this is what we'll be doing, especially when we come back. Right. On common fractions, the first thing is, what is the common fraction? All along, we've been dealing with whole numbers. One, two, three, four, five, a thousand, two thousand, up to nine thousand. Remember, grade fours, we deal with four-digit numbers. Now, a common fraction is, a part of a whole, which means a part of a whole number. For example, when we talk of a whole, 
We are referring to things like this. I have with me an apple. It is a whole. I have got one apple. So when we talk of fractions now, we are saying we want to cut this apple so that we can share it with two or three different people. So when the moment we cut an apple, um, it simply means we are sharing. So in math, when we say fractions, we are cutting it into equal parts. The bottom line is whatever whole we are, we are talking about, we are cutting it in equal parts so that no one gets more or no one gets less. Now, when we talk of a fraction, we are talking of a number whereby, for example, my, my, my apple, I have my apple, if I'm to cut it into two, I will have one half. One half. Right. What is a half? It means I have cut my apple into two equal parts. One part is called a half, and the other part is also called a half. And then we go on to see there are quite a number of things that we use for fractions. For example, we can use chocolates, we can use learners in the class. For example, we can count how many of us have got some face masks and how many of us have got some shields. Then we can compare that with the whole class. So now when you talk of, for example, the other thing that you can use is a pizza. Very soon we're eating some pizzas. I have a pizza here, a paper, which has been divided into different parts, like the way in which a pizza is cut. So this pizza here, or this piece of paper has been cut, uh, has been divided into six equal parts. Now, if you are to eat a piece, or you give your friend a piece, one out of six. So we have got a one, your friend has eaten one out of six. So one has been eaten, we say that one over six. So the fraction that has been eaten, or the part that has been eaten, is called a sixth. It is called a sixth. Now we go on to the next one again. We can even use chocolate. A chocolate, a bar of chocolate, is divided into different parts. Again, depending. The first important thing is count how many parts that chocolate has been divided into before you even cut it. Now this one has been divided into eight equal parts. So we call one part one eighth, or one, and we write it as one over eight. We go on to the next one. I put a, a paper again. This one has been divided into four equal parts, but only one part has been shaded, and we call that a quarter, and we write it as one over four. So the way that you're going to be, uh, be doing next week we have pictures and different things of the same kind. So the first thing is you must count how many parts is uh, uh, have it been divided all together. How many parts are there all together? The second part now, you need to count how many parts are shaded. After counting the number of parts, don't say, like this one here, don't say one part is, is shaded. No, yes, it's one part has been shaded, but as a fraction, we write it as one over four. And then the last part is how many parts are not shaded? How many parts are not shaded? You count the number and also when you write as a fraction, don't forget to tell us the total number of parts. And the other one, all along I've been telling you about one number at the top and then one number at the bottom. Here it's written two over three. It's written as two over three, but we say two thirds. Two thirds. The two is the number which is on top, and it is called a numerator. It is called a numerator. And then there is a line. All numbers don't have lines, but fractions, they have a line. And we call that a fraction line. And when you write, you need to show us the fraction line. And then at the bottom, we're supposed to also put another number, which is a three. That three there is called the denominator. It simply means 
our whole has been has been cut or divided into three equal parts. So the way that you're going to be looking, looking at is you are going to identify different fractions. Tell us how many parts are there all together and also tell us what fraction has been shaded and what fraction has not been shaded. Every time we talk of a fraction, remember to include the numerator and the denominator. Then when we come again next time, we are going to do addition and subtraction of common fractions. And also, when you look at addition and subtraction of common fractions, in grade 4, we deal with fractions with the same denominator. Grade 5, yes, we will change the different denominators. But us in grade 4 will be adding and subtracting fractions with the same denominator. Now, when you get those uh, worksheets at home, try to do them on your own. Whatever, whatever I just said now explains everything that you'll be doing on your own. And then, because in the exam you'll be alone, I'll be moving around checking on you. You, you be a, make sure that now you practice. By the time we write, you will be smiling. In English, already you have been told that it was made with a piece of cake. Already, I'm giving you the pieces of pizza, pieces of oranges. So it's up to you now to practice. The more you practice, the more you enjoy. And good luck, stay in the blankets again, and enjoy the meds. Thank you very much. There is Mel coming, and Mr. Ryan coming to talk to you again. Thank you. Enjoy the meds. Hello, Great Force. Uh, we do hope you enjoyed the lesson. Um, it should be available on YouTube, so if you want to go through everything again, please feel free. Please like and subscribe. Um, I have a bet with Riley. We are going to become famous YouTubers. We need your help to like and subscribe. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Please stop, Please stop <laughs> Yeah.